begin with, what did you guys think about the book of Haggai? Just overall. Daniel, what do you think about it? Um, basically, it shows the work of God. It's shows lacking, the like, there's no work of Judah. Uh -huh. He calls to the people to build the temple, and then he gives strength, and he turns off the priests, and then he wants to recreate the Judea people in there, and then he wants to purify his temple. So God makes it happen. Yeah. Um, you like this book? Candace, what do you think? You like this book? It's a good thing it was short then. Yeah, I read it like 20 times. Yeah. At first, I was just like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. But after 10 times. After 10 times. 10 times the charm on this book. Yeah, it's, a, it's an easy read, I mean, as far as length of book goes, and so that can be nice. Now, Zachariah is going to be a little different. Okay, you're going to have to dive in to Zachariah. It's like, whoa, it's a good thing we have the weekend in front of us. Eric, what do you think about Haggai? That's uh, probably like my favorite book we've read so far. Because you, yeah. you just hear about this remnant that, that's going to be purified all through these other books. You kind of see it almost culminate to here. And just to see the Davidic covenant in here. You know, yeah. And, you know, not only that, so using that aspect of the fact that, okay, we finally see some fulfillment that God's going to do a work. He's actually, he actually is going to restore his people. Um, not only that, but this is also what we might consider a more prophetic book proper, but also embedded with narrative. And so there's a flow to it as well. And I think that makes it a nice read. We actually have dates you know, that connects with it, so we kind of understand how long of a time period this is. And then when you look at this book in its more, more in its fullness, in its connection with the book of Ezra, that, kind, that, that connection makes it a really nice read as well. We can see how clearly it fits into the historical context, where some of these, you know, prophetic books we've been looking at, and the they fit within this time period of the king, and he reigned for 100,000 years, and so where exactly did this fit in? Whereas this one right here, we know exactly where it fits in, and we'll look at the book of Ezra today, too, and it will show clearly where it connects in. Aubrey, what did you think about the book? I really liked it. Um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of this promised redemption that, that you can see God walking with his people in this book now after the exile. So. Yeah. And, and fully what that promise is at the end of the book, you know, is it Zerubbabel? Is he the one that receives that promised redemption? Or is it, is it someone else? Is it even further into the future? And so it's a little fuzzy. I mean, we know it's promised, um, but what, is that, what exactly does this mean? What, what's it gonna look like? Is it gonna happen right away? And it's one of the beauties of prophetic literature is there's always this sense of now, you know, here it is, we're right on the edge of it, but the church age really complicates. When you're reading, when you just stay in the Old Testament, um, the church age is not this prominent feature. And so when you get to the New Testament, all of a sudden Christ is here, but then he goes back to heaven again. And so it's elongated again, you know, even more. I mean, that's why they expected the kingdom because, well, it wasn't as rubbable. But now we know it's the promised one, the Messiah is going to come, and so now the Messiah is here, and then he still doesn't bring about the fulfillment of these promises because now we've got the church age. But one thing we can rest assured, this is the fullness of times. We know when Christ comes again, that's it. I mean, we know exactly what's gonna take place. He's gonna come, and you know, de depending on you know, how we understand the rapture and exactly when he comes in that particular time period, we know that that initiates events that is going to bring all of this stuff to its climax and its fulfillment. But from an Old Testament perspective, that's a little more difficult. I mean, it sounds like it's Zerubbabel, right? God's going to do something special right now with Zerubbabel. He's the one. But then we know that it doesn't happen that way. And so there's a bigger picture. So that's that mountain peak that we've talked about from the beginning of class that's always there. The prophet is looking right at this situation, but oftentimes prophecy points to something much bigger that's taking place. Christine, anything you want to add to the book? You like it? I did like it. Um, <clears throat> I think that it was interesting because it kind of felt more, it almost felt more along like a narrative than it, mm -hmm. the other prophecies where it was just like message. And I know it yeah. had that structure, but um, 
I really enjoyed that they kind of did show that the people turned back and kind of saw the error in their ways. It was almost like when you made a mistake and fix it, and you're like, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So I yeah. think that it kind of felt, it was a little more tangible, I guess, I could kind of relate to it a little better. Yeah, there's a, there's a good response in, we don't always see that in the prophetic books, do we? That people actually respond and we see a turning. Um, there's a lot of promises and hope that's out there. But yeah, that narrative idea again, even with that narrative though, we, we have clearly embedded prophetic words. So you've got that prophet proper as well as a story that it fits into. And then you actually see people respond. I mean, it's got a lot of ingredients that other prophetic books have been lacking. And it's really short. It's all condensed into just one little nice package. Blaze, anything you want to add to that? Uh, I was just going to, I liked how in the like, idea of obedience, it just seemed very reachable, I guess. It seemed like, kind of seemed like it, I just kind of thought of Micah for some reason in the 6-8, and it seems like it boils down maybe to obedience. Though I, I don't know if that's true, actually. Yeah. But I don't, it was just... I like that because it's like, okay, obey. That's all we, that's we, what we can do. Yeah, and what's nice about Haggai is he makes what is obedience very clear. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we know there's something bigger than just building the temple, right? I mean, that's not, that's not what this is all about. This is about a heart that turns back towards the Lord, and the clear, tangible evidence of it is the building of the temple. So they were distracted. They were walking away. They, they're paneled houses. I mean, all these things. When you get back to the book of um, Ezra, you realize it wasn't just, hey, we're living the good life and building our paneled houses. There was opposition. Um, they had people that were fighting against them. Uh, the people of the land were opposing this particular work. And so that's why it was easy to walk away from as well. Um, Haggai doesn't focus on that part. Gee, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, you mentioned a lot with like hope and peace. And um, I, like, I really, really enjoyed this book because, um, um, I don't know, like, there's something like special about the temple of God and just like something yeah. sacred and very holy and like righteousness of God. And like, I see that in like, by the fact that like, uh, like people are like turning to the Lord and like building this like the house of the Lord and like the Lord's place with, um, with them and their heart and um, he's willing to forgive whatever they have done in the past and they are like, like saying that the Lord, like, I think it was like towards later, uh, from this day, I will bless you. Like, yeah. kind of like you have not put, uh, pro uh, produced nothing. You have yielded nothing, but like because you have committed to build this temple, like I will bless you from yeah. this day. Uh, so it was like I saw so much hope and um, and it just this is really, really, really good for me. And like there's a lot of things that he, he said also like I'm with you, like fear not, like I'm with you. And so there's a lot of uh, a lot of those verses like say that. So it was really, really like hopeful and like very. Uh, glorious, like God's, seeing God's glory in it. Yeah, partly what, you, what's, what you're emphasizing is God will be faithful. So they have to take that step. So for, when he says from this day on, that's a challenge, isn't it? Okay, look at what you've been experiencing in the past. Now I'm calling you to obedience. And when you start taking this step of obedience, you watch from this day on, you will see the blessing that I will pour out on you. Now, of course, that's always contingent on they're continuing to walk in obedience. And so this is where you really get to see that the Lord wants to bless his people. And so he's doing everything he can. He's going to give them um, hole, uh, holes in their pockets so that their money falls right through it so they don't have anything, so that they turn back to him. And once they do turn back to him, walk in obedience, then he wants to give to them. I mean, it's just beautiful what you see take place in this book. God is a God who wants to bless his people. And that's just phenomenal. Now, we live in a whole different covenant context. And so in our covenant context, the promises to us are different. The promise to us is rest, right? Remember, we talked through our covenants at the beginning of class. Our promise is rest, not all these material things. We're promised rest regardless of what our experience in this world might be. So we might be up against difficulty, persecution, whatever in the spread of the gospel, but we can know peace that passes all understanding. We can know rest in the midst of that. Paul says, whether I have lots or little, I know how to be content in the midst of all of this. Why? Because I have Jesus. The Old Testament was, you walk in obedience, I'll pour out financial, material blessing on you. You will be prosperous. 
And I think if you had me in Old Testament history and literature, one of the points I make is I think that is really the major evangelism tool in the Old Testament, that God would exalt the nation of Israel. He would pour out blessing on them, and the nations around them would go, wow, what in the world? What's going on? And you see that in Solomon's day. Queen of Sheba comes. He's this renowned man worldwide. People are coming to see what's going on there. And I think that that was the way that God exalted himself among the nations by exalting Israel and really pouring out blessing on them. Well, with us, it's different. We go out into the world and it's, the, it's this life that we can live, abundant life, that then becomes light to people around us. And so it's very, very different. But here we've got that promise of financial again. All right, let us read through this book. Uh, I can't remember, 37, whatever chapters, let me see, I mean, verses 23, 15, 38 um, verses that we have in this book. So it's not really long. Don't have a lot going on, but let us begin with Eric. Eric, you want to begin? We'll go down this way, come around, go around, come over to here. But let's begin with Eric, all right? Verse 1, chapter 1, Haggai. In his second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and, the, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of hosts says this, these people say, the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet, it is a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while the house while this house lies in ruins. Now the Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. You have come to such a harvest of oil. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to become drunk. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a basket and never enough. The Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. Go up, go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build a house. Then I will be pleased with you and be glorified in this. Expected much, but seeing it turned out to be little. For you brought home my blue and white wine, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house which remained in ruins, while each of you was busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, the earth is dry. I called for a drought on the fields and, and on the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord God, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent them. And, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty their God on the 24th day of the sixth month. Uh, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Came to the court of Hosea. Please 
from this day onward, keep your stone place, was placed upon stone before the Lord. How did you fare? When one came to attempt, he took twenty measures there with a can. When one came to the wine that to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck even all the products of your toil, with fly and, and with uh, maldi and, and with, the, with hail. They did not tempt me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward. Day of the ninth month, since the day uh, the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider with the seed yet in the barn, and you shall find the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I'll bless you. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the twenty fourth day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. All right, sometimes it, it hits us differently when we actually hear the word read out loud or actually read it out loud. Just in, in this reading we just did, did some new things really strike you as important or maybe God spoke to you in a special way? Anyone have an experience like that just now as we were reading it? Anything that stood out? Yes, AJ. Uh huh. What was it? The I am with you, or just that whole context? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Good. Others. Anything strike you differently? Just stand out a little bit more. I think something that stood out more to me um, was well, maybe because I read this is a different version than what I did that I was studying, um, but is how many times it says the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Yeah, when we see names, I mean, it's always used in an appropriate context, so we're used to seeing a name the way it's used, but yeah, when you hear it read, it's, it's like over and over and over and over again. And I, I forget, we have it in our notes, but whatever, there's 38 verses, I think it's 34 times that you have the Lord of hosts um, in this book, and so it's quite a number of times. Well, this is a, a very interesting book uh, for us, and... You know, I can tell that just from hearing your comments that you liked working your way through it. But let's think for a moment about what, well, but even before we get into that, um, how did you apply this book to your life? That's where I wanted to begin today. How did you apply it? Looked it on your worksheets. Yesenia, what's an application that you pulled out of the book of Haggai? Okay. Israel had <coughs> neglected and disobeyed the Lord. Um, but the Lord.
Lord, so Jesus has poured out his blessing upon his people and forgive them. Thank you, Lord, right? I mean, it's, it's so rich to see that and then realize, well, that applies to us too. I mean, the same way that God's done that with his people historically, the same way we see that in the church, the same way we see that in people's lives around us, he does that for us too. Just pouring out blessing on us. People who are undeserving, beginning with salvation and then everything else we have in our life. So, Jane, how'd you apply this book? Yeah, and so to think about this is, because this becomes really important aspect of this book. It's not just that they're procrastinating. Their, their hearts have been turned away and set on other things. That's why it's trying to make that point there. You dwell in your paneled houses, but my house is desolate. In other words, what is the focus of your attention? What, where, what has your heart? What, what, where is your treasure, that whole idea? And the point being made, it's in your homes, it's in your wor world, it's in your existence, and it's in your little life that you're living. But what about what I'm doing in this world? What about what I'm up to? What about the worship of my name? What about getting back to the Mosaic Covenant and bringing sacrifices and offerings in the way that my people should be? Why is your heart not in these things, but yet your heart's over here? And so we have to pull back and realize, okay, well, what does that mean to us? Because Jesus wants us to be all in as well. And so what are those things that, that lure our heart away and we get distracted by these kinds of things? and we get pulled toward them so that the things that God's doing in this world and the ways in which he wants us to be engaged with what he's doing then is lying desolate and it's not taking place. And let's face it, the church is in the midst of some serious things that we need to deal with. Materialism runs rampant in the church. When I used to go down to, I've been down to Brazil a number of times to um, a missionary training center down there, uh, birthed the Radicals Project, just sending Brazilian South Americans to the 1040 window. And they have this big display case with this, with this lettering across the top. And in the display case, it has Coke bottles from around the world, just many different kinds of Coke products. And what it says across the top in Portuguese is that Brazilians spend more money on Coca-Cola then they invest in missions. Now that display case is a huge thing to think about. Um, it's making a strong point, isn't it? That our hearts can be so drawn toward certain things. And then the, work, the Lord's work lies desolate. And it's still the biggest issue in South America. They got a lot of passion to go to the mission field, but the churches don't give money to support it down there. Well, that's a... That's not just a Brazilian problem. It's not just a South American problem. We've got those kind of issues here in America too. What pulls our heart away? When you think about people, vocations. Vocations can just drain people's energy and focus. Now, vocation done in a God-honoring way, where it's life on life and you're engaging with people and you're a light and you're, you're doing ministry right there in your work and you're doing your work good as to the glory of the Lord. All those things are good. But the kind of time that we can invest in that and then therefore the, church, the, the work of the church gets left undone or lies desolate, those are the kind of things that we have to think. Relationships can do this too, right? Relationships can just draw us away from the Lord that's not healthy. We want relationships that encourage us, stir us to love the Lord, not draw us away. So all kind of applications that we could try to pull out of this. Other applications, what did you come up with? I was just thinking how um, Paul just, just 
describes us as uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's kind of interesting how much concern the Lord shows of his temple in Haggai and having that maintained and built, made beautiful. And then in, if we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit, I think that could be applied in the same way. And that could be like taking care of ourselves in a spiritual sense, definitely, and, and communing with God, but also like physically and emotional health, I think, too. Yeah, to, to take that temple imagery, I mean, that's who we are, and to think about what, it, what does it mean for us to build up our temple, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the temple's not just you, it's, it's your brothers and sisters in Christ, too. And what does it mean for you to be building them up, life on life, discipling, so that they're growing in Christ, so that the glory of the temple, which is talking about here, is actually seen in the body of Christ. A pure, healthy, spiritually vibrant body that's moving it forward, advancing God's purposes in this world. Is, is an amazing thing to think of as well. Good. Other applications. Esther? Um, it was really interesting. This kind of reminds me of a sermon that I heard recently um, where the pastor was talking about um, that God can use hardship to as discipline to get our attention, um, which is really evident in Haggai because he keeps saying, like, look at what you're doing. See, this is your situation. Have you checked your life recently? And you wonder why things aren't going so well. And I mean, it's true that, of course, hardship isn't always discipline from God, but um, it is like a good reminder, I guess, to look or consider my life and think, if there are hard things, like, am I right with God? Yeah, so if you had me for Old Testament history and literature, um, you might recall this. If you did not, just a quick summary. I mean, the theology of Genesis that I pulled out is really difficulty is what God brings into this world. He rigs the world with difficulty. Why? To bring us to an end of ourselves, to drive us to dependence on Him. And that's the idea here. And that's the idea of the curses, too. It's not that God says, I'm in charge, I'm all-powerful, you mess with me, you're going down. That's not the point at all. The point is, when your heart goes in that direction, that's death. And I love you too much to let you go towards death. Therefore, I bring these curses into your life to turn your heart back toward me. I want to bring you to the end of yourself, drive you to the depends on myself. So now we're not in the Mosaic Covenant, but God operates the same way. The one the Lord loves, He disciplines. Well, what does that discipline look like in our life? And for Israel, everything you read in chapter 1, you can find in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. It was all spelled out for them. For us, it's not so clearly spelled out. Um, what all this is going to look like. What does it mean for the Lord to discipline us? But he does. Um, Paul even says, some of you are sick and have even died. Wow. <laughs> what does that look like? I mean, the New Testament just doesn't give us a lot of clear teaching on what the discipline of the Lord looks like. So if you had a flat tire on your way to school today, that wasn't necessarily the discipline of the Lord trying to get your attention, although God does all these things to get our attention, right? Whether it's discipline or God just putting the squeeze on us because He wants us to be refined, it all is difficulty and it all causes our heart to turn to the Lord. Just think about Job for a second. Remember his friends? They looked at his life and said, you are experiencing the curse, therefore you have sinned. So, what you need to do is repent of your sin and blessing will be restored to you. <laughs> Job's saying, what? I, I know, my heart's pure. And so in the book of Job we learn, it's not just for discipline that we experience these things, it's also because the Lord is refining us. He's helping us to love him more. And so he's at work in our lives trying to get our attention. So it doesn't matter to us whether it's discipline or refining, our response is to be the same. We turn our heart towards the Lord. He gets more of us. We depend more deeply on Him. And that's all that's going on here, and that has application to our life as well. And, you know, maybe you've had experiences just like this, where you worked hard and trying to get all this money, but you really weren't managing your money, stewarding your money with God's purposes in mind. It was all about you, you, you and you just never knew where all your money was going. I know a lot of people that are in this situation, I think, actually, where they're working so hard to make ends meet, but they're not 
disciplining themselves to give to what the Lord's doing in this world. And there's, there's some things that we can learn from this. Now, the New Testament principle is the Lord loves a cheerful giver. I mean, he wants us to give cheerfully. We don't owe God something. We aren't trying to pay him off. What, what we need to learn is everything already belongs to him. And so we give a portion back to him, but when we hold that for ourselves, we're doing the same thing they're doing here. The work of the Lord is lying desolate while they live in their paneled houses and we have our vacations and our, you know, whatever we might have that then is distracting our heart away. And so we might experience hardship, the Lord trying to get our attention to turn our hearts back to him. So we can experience some very real things. Olivia, what'd you come up with? Yeah. And kind of showing how they, when they weren't obeying God, the things happened, but then kind of compared to being part, like in the time period. So I kind of went on my phone that one life I didn't take a moment to like look back on my journey with God and like kind of how things have gone. And maybe like I don't really like journaling, but I start journaling or like talking to a friend to like really see how God's working in my life. So, yeah, kind of so some kind of reflecting. Yeah. That's really important. Yeah. You know, it's so funny, as soon as you start talking about the dates, it reminded me, I, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but this former student, I still see regularly, and I think about this every now and then, when he came to the book of Haggai, um, he was, he, he, I think it was application, he said, in this book, dates are very important. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a date for this, a date for that, dates, 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 and then it said, why can't I get a date? <laughs> I'll never forget that. And he just went, and then he just, that was his whole application. He just went off on his whole desires to have a date and this girl he was pursuing. And it was just so funny. Yeah. And uh, I wonder, I wonder if she knows about it. I think, I think this is the one that he ended up marrying. I mean, it was a long journey and he finally ended up marrying her. I think I need to ask him about that to see if that was one, but why can't I get a date? <laughs> that was his application. Why can't I get a date? All right, anything else, Adam? You got anything you want to add to that? Not the dating part, but the <laughs> application part? Yeah. Um, actually, um, my application was the same as what you were saying about uh, just making room for, for God. A lot of times I see in my own life, I kind of spend more time building up myself One of the examples that came to my mind was just how working in my church, I get burnt out, especially with being in school and then having to do youth ministry. Um, and I get really burnt out from it and almost uh, uh, bitter because I can't get help from other people uh, to a point where I just start saying no. I might have God calling me, okay, go do this, find time to do it. And I would just say no because I've got to a point where I just time for myself. Yeah. And I kind of seen that with the people when they were building up their own houses, when they should have been spending more time on building up the temple yeah. to bring uh, glory back to God. Yeah. So that's what I see. And there, of course, there's a, there's a holistic sense to that too, right? Because we can burn ourselves out in ministry, and sometimes it's because we're striving after the wrong things, yeah. okay? And, but at the same time, how do we find that balance? For instance, um, my dad's generation, my dad's 72 now, I think, 72, 73, somewhere around there. He's old. Um, but his generation, they sacrificed family for the sake of the ministry. I mean, it was ministry, everything. Everything was ministry. And the family was just on the sideline. I mean, you just had to suck it up. It was all about dad and his ministry, or mom and her ministry. My generation has, I think, wrestled with, I mean, it's the whole soccer mom generation where family is everything, everything. The kids and making the kids' life better than our own. And I've watched my generation go in this direction and even generations beyond and probably your generation might even just accentuate it even more. But everything's about the, uh, about the family and ministry falls by the wayside. Well, how, how, do we, how are we supposed to live? I mean, pendulum swings happen all the time. So what is it supposed to look like? And you know, that's kind of what we have to deal with here. What does it mean 
to be a kind of person that lives in this world and has friends and enjoys a good meal and enjoys laying in the hammock on his back porch, which I love to do. I love my Mexican hammocks. Every time they break, I go buy another one. Just love that versus the pressures and demands of ministry. There's always something to be done. And so how do we not sacrifice the life that God's called us to live because we're so driven by ministry versus we love life so much <laughs> and living the life so much that ministry goes by the wayside. How do you do that? Um, it becomes really tough. And as a dad, I've had to try to walk that path all these years, and it's really tough. Ministry never stops. There's always one more thing to do, one more person to be with, one more lesson or to prepare or sermon to prepare. There's always some people's lives are infinite <laughs> and all the itch issues are infinite. Um, and, and how we do that in a way that is God honoring, that doesn't sacrifice people, relationships along the way, and, and doesn't lead to us being driven by these ministry concerns is important. But you gotta be careful that you don't sacrifice what God wants, and that's the point you're making. God calling you to something and you, 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 you walk away from that um, when God has actually called you something. Learning to be led by the Spirit is huge because if not, you're just driven by the flesh. Ministry can be driven by the flesh or it can be driven by the Spirit. And don't ask me to explain that fully because I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> um, I, I get a lot of flesh in the way of ministry. There's so many demands out there, so many opportunities out there that it's just easy to get on this little, you know, cycle like a hamster in a cage. Um, just real quick, while we're talking about this particular idea, since a couple of you brought up, look at Hebrews chapter 12, because it really brings home, in a New Testament context, some of what Haggai is talking about. Hebrews chapter 12, verses that we've probably read a number of times, but it really brings home what Haggai is saying. Chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In other words, there are things that can weigh us down. There are sins that can distract us. And the author of Hebrews is saying, you lay those things aside. Don't let them get in the way of you running your race. See, that was the problem back in Haggai's day. When you go back to Ezra, they had opposition. And they had um, just rebuilding their life back in the land. Their houses were in ruin when they came back. And so they've been rebuilding their houses. But running that race that was laid out before them, they became distracted from that, getting the temple back. <sighs> And this is one of the reasons why 1st and 2nd Chronicles is written. Okay, 1st and 2nd Chronicles is written after the exile. And it's written to encourage the people to build the temple. Because it looks back over the same material you find in Kings. Chronicles and Kings, almost exactly the same material. But the theological thrust of Chronicles is proper worship brings the Lord's blessing. And so it's written to this post-exilic community encouraging them to get the temple built again. Why? So that God could restore their blessing. They, they were getting it backwards. They were dwelling in their paneled houses while the house was desolate. They needed to get the house built so that they could worship the Lord the way that he called them to worship so that God could pour out blessing on them. It was backwards for them. And so even though they were experiencing some blessing, as they gathered, they were putting into pockets with holes because the Lord wanted to get their attention. So for us, it's let's lay these things aside, run that race before us, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross at the right hand of the throne of God. And so he kept on that course. So we've got to find that course for us as well. We don't want to be like the people back in Haggai's day. All right, let's look back at the book of Haggai. You hopefully uh, spent some time finding an outline. Whoops, I did the wrong thing. Hopefully you spent some time finding an outline for this book and a main message. And so let's talk for a moment about what you found. 
with that. Brian, you got a main message? Yeah. What would your main message be? Okay, so you've got that blessing that will flow from that. Because the people were experiencing hardship. And there was a reason why. They were distracted. They had let the temple just be laid waste on the side. Uh, Jessica, how would you put the main message? Yeah, I'm going to summarize. I said that um, the main message is that the Lord blesses those who seek after him. Okay, so, so just even getting beyond the temple, just the whole idea that the Lord blesses those who seek after him. That allows for both uh, an Old Testament and a New Testament concept. Okay, when we seek the Lord, the Lord blesses us. Olivia? All right, so God is faithful to curse them. Yeah, but he wants to be faithful to bless them too. So if they're going to receive that part of God's faithfulness, they're going to have to change their ways as far as that goes. All right, who else wants to add one here? Daniel, you got one for us? Okay, so you, you put the, the emphasis on the Lord building and blessing. The Lord's building and blessing. My kids have always said, Dad, when you write, how does your class understand anything that you write on the board? I say, because it's all in the context. We're talking about it while I'm writing. They get it. Brian, we began with you, right? So let's go here and see how, how you ended up there. What are your major divisions? How about structure? Yeah, one, one through 11. All right, so you've got four yeah. divisions here. Anybody have anything other than four divisions? Esther? Okay, what would you call that? Okay, so the people obey and the Lord promises his presence. All right, anyone else different than four divisions? Anyone more than four? Yeah, I had five divisions. Um, so I started on chapter 1, 1 through 11, so the command from the Lord. Uh, then 1, 12 to 15, which is the people's response. And so that response would have been seeking after the Lord. And then so chapter 2, I just divided that up into the different messages from Haggai. Okay. Okay, so the, this is the first message on that day. And then you've got the second message on that day. Everybody got that? So in verse 20, it says, the word of the Lord came to Haggai again on that particular day. Anyone else? Anything different than four divisions? That means everybody else did four? Okay. Okay, how, how'd you do it? Okay, so you did these three together, and you called it what? 
All right, the temple, da da da, and the glory of God shone in the obedience of his people. And then four, same. Um, yeah. What'd you call it? God blesses the remnant that was going Okay, so you got the whole idea of blessing that's there. Anyone else? You have one unit. How do you have one division? <laughs> so you called it a unit. It's just, okay, how did you do it? Uh, I just did the whole thing. Uh huh. And I uh, just did the Lord calls for his people to reestablish the temple so the Lord may bless them as his presence. Okay, that's called a main message. <laughs> <laughs> I changed the words a little bit for my main message. Uh, you did. So, but as <laughs> far as paragraphs to go, how did you, how did you group the paragraphs together? Yeah, now the reason I think many of you probably use four divisions is because you've got these dates that roll through the book, right? So at least that's a way that the, the message breaks up. And so whether that's four or whether you've got five because you do these two right here, I mean, can vary. But we obviously have different prophetic words that are being given, unless you just go with a unit, and then that works too. Okay, let's look at that first page in your notes, page 118. The, the main message that I have here is, and I don't know if I can get it up here or not. Let's see if we can just see it. Whoops. I really did turn this thing off. I thought I'd try to turn it back on. It's very simple, so let me just tell it to you. Um, the house of David and the house of God. The house of David and the house of God. And unlike other prophetic books, this message obviously is just a few months long. And so it just fits in the one year, really months, but you see in your notes there, 520. And it's really the message is found or where we see this embedded in the historical narrative is in Ezra chapters five and six. But the house of David and the house of God. And so you've got not just a temple in view here, but you've got this dynasty in view as well. And so part of what's going on at the end with Zerubbabel and the promises given to him are much more focused on um, the fulfillment of this kingly line, ultimately in Messiah, than just on the temple itself. But look at the a few notes that we have on the prophet himself. Again, you see the name and what it means. But look at point B. We know nothing of him apart from this book. He was possibly a priest um, given this special interest in rebuilding the temple. Uh, we do know that he's mentioned in the book of Ezra. And so it says through these prophets, um, Haggai and Zechariah, their contemporary prophets, um, but we just don't know much about him. He's known as the prophet. <clears throat> so there may have been a scarcity of prophets in his day. So we're after exile moving forward. He appeals to the ruling of a priest um, in chapter 2, verse 11. That's very interesting that he would do, do that. Um, Ask now the priests for a ruling. Now this is coming from the Lord, but it's through the prophet Haggai. Um, his focused interest is rebuilding the temple. His name is connected to some of the Psalms in certain ancient versions. So when you look at the LXX or the Septuagint and you look at these specific Psalms, his name's actually connected some. So did he have a role in temple as priest um, providing some leadership there? That's some of the speculation that's out there. Point C, Haggai along with Zechariah was a key prophetic figure in the rebuilding of the temple. So again, um, hopefully you're moving toward the book of Zechariah if you haven't already. These two guys are contemporaries. Now, Zechariah's prophecy is going to be for a longer time period. Um, Haggai is very concise. Now, how much prophetic activity he had outside of what we find in this book, um, we don't know. Um, but more than likely, he was a contemporary of Zechariah and worked alongside of him and had other impact on the people. 
but they don't mention each other in their respective books. They're both mentioned in Ezra, but Haggai doesn't mention Zechariah. He mentions a lot of people, but he doesn't mention Zechariah, and Zechariah doesn't mention him as well. And then point D, he preached for four months that we have recorded. Okay, this is all about written prophecy, four months in 520 B.C. And this particular scholar Finnegan notes that the dates August 29th, 520 B.C. to December 18th. So, what's the date today? November 28th. We are coming to the end of of the celebration of Haggai's ministry um, to the nation of Judah or the people that returned to the land. Now, introductory comments. We mentioned earlier in 38 verses of this book, Yahweh's mentioned 34 times. So you've got Lord, 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 Lord of hosts throughout this book. Um, notice again the connection with the book of Zechariah. Um, in Haggai, we have the second year, sixth month, day one. And then we have second year, six month, day 24. And then you can see at the top of the next page, just continues on. And then Zechariah is going to jump in. And second year, eighth month. So in the early part of Zechariah, we also have some dates. Once we get into all the vision stuff, um, there's not a lot of dating um, that happens there. But you can see a little bit of the connection. So thus, the time frame for Haggai's prophecy is only four months, whereas Zechariah's is for two years, at least in his book, what we have as far as recorded dates. Uh, but there's overlap between the two. Um, background issues. With the book of Haggai, we make a shift to the post-exilic period. Now, this is important for us to get the post-exilic period. It's going to be a little bit different. We talked about this some last time last class period, but when we think about the exile and all that takes place leading up to this, this is where we see most of prophetic activity in both the north and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is eventually taken away by the Assyrians. Southern kingdom continues on into exile. Now, after the exile, the Lord, we have the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, which are the two historical books that follow the exile. We have the story of Zerubbabel, and then Ezra, and then we have Nehemiah. These three people, and this has nothing to do with Zen Buddhism, but Z-E-N, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, they bring people back into the land. Now, I, I, I taught my Old Testament history and literature class, I always remember the name Zerubbabel because I remember just from my very young age Sunday school class, the way you remembered the first return was the rubber ball came bouncing back into the land. The rubber ball, the rubber ball, the rubber ball came bouncing back into the land. And so I've known, I mean, if it was a Bible trivia question, who was the leader of the first return? The rubber ball. I mean, I always knew that one. And so they come back into the land now, exile is the ultimate in judgment that God is going to take them out of their land. And so he has their attention. They come back into the land, but we still have prophetic activity. We still have got sin going on in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. They're still struggling in their Mosaic covenant, still struggling in their walk with the Lord. Um, at the books of um, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi also remind us that they're still struggling because we've got a lot of sin issues that this is dealing with. I mean, they're barely back in the land and Haggai's already talking about misplaced priorities. Okay, in other words, they've been in exile, they learned some lessons, but again, when you start looking at all this, you know, when you take theology and you learn about human depravity, um, you can cite verses, you know, chapter and verse, this is where we see human depravity, but all you do is read the Old Testament. Right? And you see it all over the place. Just get to the New Testament, read it again. Depravity is made very clear for us. Um, Israel continues to struggle in their relationship with the Lord. And so Haggai is going to speak into that and address it. Now, point A there, we make this shift to the post exilic period. The exile has occurred, and some of the people have made their way back to land. And again, Ezra tells us those in whom the Lord stirs up their heart, they go back to land. And this is all under the, the decree of Cyrus in 538 B.C. 
Uh, we had the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonians conquered them, they reigned for a while, now the Persians have come in and they've conquered and we see that transition take place in the book of Daniel. Daniel is a book that's written during this, time, during this particular time period that shows us that transition to Persia. But now it's 520 BC. And so 538, we had this decree to come back, now it's 520, the people have been back in the land and they're just not finishing this temple project. Now note the connections with the book of Ezra. In Ezra chapters one through six, it deals with the return from the Babylonian captivity under Zerubbabel and gives the history down to the completion of the rebuilding of the temple. Okay, so we see that in chapters one through six. The temple had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. That was way back over here with the fall of Jerusalem. The Babylonians came in, Nebuchadnezzar, he's a part of that destroying the temple. He, and then when Cyrus conquers the Babylonian kingdom, he issues a decree then that allows the people to come back. So we've got this 70 year exile and now the people are coming back into the land and they're gonna rebuild the temple. Again, once they rebuild this temple, then it's gonna be destroyed in 70 AD. Um, later on. Now look at point number two. On their return to the land, they began to rebuild the temple and in fact had laid the foundation. Now that's Ezra chapter 3, 6 through 4, 5. So the foundation is laid um, before they became discouraged. And this discouragement led to about a 15 year delay in building the temple. And so we've got a problem here. Now they're distracted, paneled houses, they're living the life. Point number three there, page 119, it was not until the reign of Darius that they began to persevere in the project that the Lord had assigned to them. In the second year of Darius, Haggai and Zechariah began to prod the leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua, and the people. The temple was finished four years later. So when you look back at Ezra, it's one of those books, I think we use this as the example, it's one of those books where you can see clearly where the book of Haggai fits in. In Ezra chapter four, in verse 24, it says, then work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Chapter five, verse one, when the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Adu, prophesied to the Jews, who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So when they prophesy, verse two, then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, arose and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Now that's an interesting verse right there, towards the end. Not only did they prophesy God's word, but they were there supporting them in this project. And many people believe that Ezra is the one who actually wrote First and Second Chronicles, the book that says, let's look back historically, when people worship God, he blesses them. So, build a temple. So they, they're all sitting there encouraging the people and then it continues on with the story at that point. So where does Haggai fit in this story? Well, Ezra 4, 24, Chapter five, verse one, we've got Haggai the prophet that fits right there in that particular story. And we get to see the success of that. All right, we'll pick up here. Next class period where we are together, but leave your Haggai projects right here. And uh, we will finish this on Monday and get into Zechariah. So enjoy those visions. And we'll see you on Monday. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.